Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name. I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. At Chehi, we're a people of song. And we speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs every evening. And that's been part of the tradition of Chehi and one of the things that brings it all together. While we are here to make music, we're here in a Christian community. It's when that is voice to voice, proclaiming God's greatness. I'm going to be speaking to you this morning about musicians as priests and proclaiming God's covenant. And um, I'll be touching again on the theme verse of last night, but I'm talking about the bigger, pa- the bigger passage of 2 Chronicles 5. But to begin with, music itself, it's been essential to what it means to be human since the beginning of time. Even as we look at scriptures and we look back in Genesis chapter 4, we see Genesis 4.21, Jubal was the father of those who play the lyre and pipe. We think of music as a noun. We're used to this as a product and something on a stage. And a lot of us love the stage or sometimes are intimidated by it. But we have a dynamic in modern society that music is on a stage. But I have long been inspired by the concept of rethinking music as a verb. Nicholas Walterstorff, he is a philosopher and theologian. Uh, He's on faculty at, or used to be on faculty at Yale University. Uh, He writes on art in action and the function of all art um, and the way that it relates in terms of dialogue and society. Christopher Small is a musicologist from New Zealand. He discusses the concept of musicking. Music, we don't have a verb, not in the English language, but dance does. (laughs) To paint or you are painting. To dance or you are dancing. So, He's a New Zealander, so why not reinvent the English language? So, to music, to music together, musicking. So to rethink it as a verb. And in Christian faith, we have some precedent for this. Because our word, hymn, is actually a verb. That we can hymn to our God. To our God. I just want to describe from Christopher Small. This is the way he describes musicking. The act of musicking, M-U-S-I-C-K-I-N-G, establishes in the place where it is happening a set of relationships, and it's in those relationships that the meaning of the act lies. They're not found only between those organized sounds, which are conventionally thought of as being the stuff of musical meaning, but it's also between the people who are taking part. Relationships between person and person, between individual and society, between humanity and the natural world, and even perhaps the supernatural world. That's Christopher Small's concept as an educator and musicologist on musicking. Bringing it back to scripture, the Apostle Paul writes very similarly in the church. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing or speaking to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness to your heart in God. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Here in the early church, they didn't have a stage. It was around the Lord's Supper. It was around their agape love feast, that this is the way they interacted. Even in the history of the church, there was no stage, not until the last hundred plus years. So in two millennia of the church, it's only around about 130 years ago with revival preachers and song leaders and choirs brought up front. Before that, the choirs would be to the side or up in a mezzanine. And if we look around our churches today, we see those different models. It was only really about 400 years ago or so that even in our, um, the worldwide music tradition, that we started bringing musicians up onto the stage. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the stage. I'm also sometimes afraid when I'm getting up on the stage, but music was not so much a production or a performance, but rather an integral part of living. Songs which were not on a stage, but singing by the water fountain in the middle of the town, supporting a dance, 
or supporting worship. So now turning to the temple, can you open your Bibles? I would like to read 2 Chronicles 5. Again, verse 13 is the theme on the back of the t-shirt. But I want to go through verses 1 through to 14 to look at this context. So through the history of Israel, we have that Moses was shown by God the plans for how people were to approach God, but also how God would reveal his presence and dwell with his people. And he gave those plans in the tabernacle. But then as he established David as the king... It was his son Solomon who finally had the privilege to build that temple, as God had shown how he would dwell with his people. So let me read with us 2 Chronicles 5. Thus all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, and stored the silver, the gold, and all the vessels in the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the Ark. And they brought up the Ark, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The Levitical priests brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at um, Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions. And all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, their sons and kinsmen arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters. And our debate about horns and other instruments of that general category. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord. Can you say it with me? For he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. And then verse 14 so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I've always marveled as I got more into Old Testament study, this blueprint of the temple. How God will give his specific instructions. I've seen, seen plenty of debates and opinions in churches as we look at the different design shapes, what's at the center, the way that the church sits. And um, our church had some discussion about possibly flipping the church on its side, try something different. There weren't, wasn't that flexibility in the temple. God gave his plan. Now, with our churches in the New Testament era of knowing the redemption in Christ, we have more flexibility in the meeting place. Sometimes not even in a building, but in a home. But in this temple, there's something here that lasts as a message, even if it's not the way we build our buildings today, because it was how God showed both how he would dwell with his people, but also how we would approach him. So a brief description of the temple. They would enter from the east. That so you would see the idea that the rising sun shines into the temple. The people do not worship the sun. God's sun and his light illuminates the temple. 
As they come into the temple, the first thing that you see as you come in through the gate is the high altar. And the first message on this on worship is that high altar, there is no worship without sacrifice. If you caught the verse earlier on that they were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. We talk about tithes and offerings and passing the plate in church. This was a sacrifice that was costly because to approach a God who is holy and perfect it was not cheap. There is no worship without sacrifice. There was a labor for cleansing because to approach God we are a messy people and even the sacrifice itself is a messy process. As they approach towards the temple, the idea that there was a ceremonial washing and cleansing. But then this brings us closer and closer towards the holiness of God. And even when you go to the fine descriptions of the temple elsewhere in Scripture, you see that the metal, as you get closer to the holy of holies, gets more precious. So as we go into the holy place, on the left is a golden lampstand illuminating with buds on the branches, like the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. You've got the golden lampstand that is illuminating the metal around this holy place. On the right is a table of showbread that you've got here remembering that God provided for his people. And that you've got it, it is um, sprinkled with frankincense, that even the smell and the aroma. Worship for them was multi-sensory. You've got the Beauty of the eyes in the light flickering off the precious metal. You have the smell of frankincense. Then directly in front before you reach the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. Where the priest would pray for the people surrounding. As God dwelled with the people, the role of the priest was that intercessory prayer. That he would approach the throne of God on behalf of the people. Then you have the Holy of Holies. As you continue heading from the east gate through the high altar, the labor of cleansing, through the holy place that has got the light, the provision of showbread, and the altar of incense, then you reach behind that veil, you reach the holy of holies where there is the ark of the covenant. Guarded by the cherubim, both concealing God's wrath, but also revealing his presence that he would dwell with his people. With this incredible building that is God's footstool, it is his throne of how he showed how he had claimed his people. There's a few things back on this verse that I want to draw our attention to as we talk about what it meant for people to gather. Number one, it was a feast, not a concert. Again, I don't want to make too many disclaimers on this, but I love a great concert. But this was, the musicians were not on a stage, it was around an entire feast that when you look at the feast through the rhythm of the annual calendar of Israel. And in verse 3, the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. It revolved around their feasts. Secondly, the throne of God is at the center of everything they do. This Ark of the Covenant, the footstool, the throne... It was the central focus. Verse 7. When the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. Thirdly, the priests were consecrated for service. Verse 11. When the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions. Uh, When I've worked with church musicians and with worship teams, I often use this phrase with them to say, the first sacrifice was for the priests before they started sacrificing for the people. And I know in myself, my years of leading worship in churches, uh, being involved in church music is that part of my life as well. How quick I can see my insignificance, my unworthiness. How can I stand up there and lead other people towards the throne of God when I know my own failing? But the priests were the same. They needed to be consecrated that the sacrifice would first be for them before they could minister for other people. So that is the context as we look at this big picture. It's not a stage. 
but I haven't gotten yet to this discussion about the musicians, which I want to bring back into it. So some of this is doubling up on last night, but I think it, were, it bears repeating because it really strikes me as I think through this, we're looking at the whole dedication of the temple. They were a priestly service, 120 trumpets. We don't quite have that many at Chehi, but between the trumpets, the string players, the woodwinds, the voices, the pianists, the percussion, as we look at this, we come back again to verse 13. And those three points I'll briefly revisit from last night. It was their duty to make themselves heard. This was a priestly service that, as I could imagine, coming up to that temple, if all of Israel is gathering around for the feasts and that they are being there not just for a uh, one and a half an hour concert, but as they gather. We talked about that in the holy place that you've got the eyes, that lampstand that's illuminating. You've got the incense. But now we talk about the ears. That is usually our favorite part, given what we're here for. It was their duty to make themselves heard. And these musical instruments were not for musical production. These were weapons, instruments, vessels to be used to proclaim the king and that he dwelt with his people and that he had made it possible that people could approach the throne of God. And then again, this message, which we repeated last night, I'll ask you to repeat again. For he is good. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That this is the covenant he has made. Chesed, on the back of the t-shirts for the rest of this summer. His faithfulness, his covenant, his covenantal love, his mercy, his loyal love. When we look at worship or any use of music that we have as believers, we've got this idea of musicking that talks about it as a series of relationships. When we look at worship in the same way, and especially as musicians, it is a dialogue. It's an act of approaching our God that he would respond, that we would dare to approach him. As we look through this verse, and we went through, through verse 13 before, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. There is a response and a result. The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. God tangibly made his presence known for the people of Israel. That same presence that was the um, pillar of cloud of smoke and fire that led them through to the wilderness, established his residence with his people. In their priestly service, these priests and musicians were so overwhelmed with the presence of God that they could not stand to minister. They were overwhelmed by his glory. A writer I have uh, really enjoyed reading over the years. Um, I've heard him speak several times as well as Jeremy Begbie. And in his book, Resounding Truth, he writes this. If I were to walk onto a platform to give a piano recital, and introduce the evening by telling the audience that I was about to help them tune into the order of the cosmos, that some of the pieces I was about to play were more cosmically in tune than others, and that the best pieces would help them be finer people and bring them that much closer to the creator, the audience might well conclude I needed therapy. But this is at the center of his ethos, that we resound the truth of God and the glory of God. So in many senses, while that sounds crazy, this is true. And even through the Middle Ages, we look at the way that we talked about the muses, the relationship to the spheres and the planets. Throughout all of humanity, secular as well as religious, there's something about the curiosity with the relationship to the cosmos. Every time you start to resonate that bow, every time a piano key is struck, you blow wind through a wind instrument, you bang that bass drum or the God-given vocal cords start to resonate. Every air particle in this room resonates. The principle of sympathetic resonance, piano strings start ringing when your foot's on the pedal and some singer is wailing away, singing beautifully. Um, I saw that, Mr. Raleigh. So as 
a piano resonates from other instruments, or that snare drum is left on while others are making it and you hear it vibrating. The air particles in the room are vibrating. But in that sense that we see that we are resonating with the cosmos. Friends, every time we blow our horns, bow our strings, resound those keys, and speak to each other in song, this is exactly what we do. We are proclaiming that steadfast love of God. Tune my heart to sing His praise. We work hard to tune. We work hard to align, to collaborate, find ensemble. But we need to tune our hearts that we would first be consecrated for His service as musicians. In closing this morning, and again coming back to the theme verses on the back of the t-shirts, it is one of the most commonly used phrases throughout Scripture. They didn't have hymnals like we do. They didn't have data projectors giving the lyrics. But they would have the refrain that the worship leader would declare something about God's goodness and the people would respond. So I'm going to read a few verses at the beginning and end of Psalm 136. In Psalm 136, the psalmist gives counts of God and his character, his work in Israel, but then his work in us. I'm not going to read all 26 verses, but I'm going to give the first three verses and then jump to 22. And like the people of Israel who did not have hymnals in front of them, they responded, for he is good, for his love endures forever. So the words I want you to repeat on each verse is, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Jumping to verse 22, it is he who remembered us in our lower state. For his steadfast love endures forever and rescued us from our foes. For his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. That covenant love that's based on his character. Would you please pray with me? O oh Lord, the God of heaven, may you first work in our hearts that we will be consecrated before you. We are unworthy for your service. We are imperfect musicians. We strive for perfection, but the more we work, the more we can see how we need to grow as musicians. But Lord, may you work in our hearts that we would know your steadfast love. Lord, in so many ways, this whole world tries to redefine what that concept is. Lord, may we know love in your sacrificial context, that you loved us so much that you would send your holy and perfect son to die in our place. Lord, tune our hearts, we pray. May we this week be fixated upon your throne. You represented it to Israel through the Ark of the Covenant. But Lord, when Jesus went to the cross, that veil was torn in two that we may approach our God boldly in praise and thanksgiving. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. We thank you. Amen.